a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I've mostly been working with developer companies or data companies for the last uh, little over a decade or so. Uh, I was a product manager back at Heroku back in the day, primarily built Heroku Postgres, uh, spent a lot of time uh, launching a bunch of core languages there, spent some time at Citus Data that was acquired by Microsoft, and now at Crunchy Data running our, our recently launched cloud database. If uh, any of you are Postgres fans already, um, may want to take a look at Postgres Weekly. It's a weekly newsletter I curate, uh, really targeted at app devs, not DBAs, not kind of the DevOps side, but uh, hey, I want to learn about the cool features in Postgres and leverage them. Um, it's usually about five to 10 articles each week, uh, so not too much to get through overall. Um, but for those of you that maybe aren't Postgres fans, um, hopefully there's a, a few of you here so I can change your mind throughout. Um, we're going to go into today a, a kind of whirlwind tour of what's in Postgres, why it's interesting, what makes it unique against other databases. So first, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, Postgres was released in 1989. Uh, that's, that's over 30 years now. It's really old. Uh, it has a lot of roots as um, like the grandfathers of databases. So if you look at its name, uh, it means post ingress. It came out of UC Berkeley. Ingress was one of the early databases there. A number of databases are based off Ingress. I think it's DB2. Um, I'd have to check maybe Sybase. Um, I don't believe Oracle has roots there, but um, SQL Server does. So a lot of databases come back out of this same core. Um, Postgres didn't pick up the SQL part till later, but still that core database is, is over 30 years old. Um, it generally takes quite a while to mature a relational database. and when you're building on Postgres, you're building on a pretty solid foundation. Another little bit uh, into the archives. Uh, Tom Lane is a top contributor to Postgres and a whole lot of, of open source. Um, he helped create JPEG, TIFF, uh, PNG, uh, worked on those specs, co-authored libjpeg, libpng. And then about 20 years ago, he got bored with image format and said, hey, what's this database thing? I'm going to give my, my hand at it. And uh, this is one of the most common mistakes I see made is uh, it's kind of a fun email from the, the mailing list, uh, almost coming up on 25 years now. We're saying, hey, we made a big mistake. We shouldn't have you know, added the SQL on the end of it. When we added support for SQL, we should have just left it Postgres. Um, that's the easiest way to not butcher the pronunciation. Just call it Postgres. Um, the other acceptable form is PostgreSQL not PostgreSQL. So under the covers, Postgres is just a giant append-only log. Um, when you write data, it adds data to the log. So if you think about updating a new record, what it does is essentially mark that record is dirtied, and then it writes a new one. When you delete a record, it actually just marks that as dirty and comes through later and cleans that up. Um, this is helpful when you look at things like vacuum and, and bloat and that sort of thing. But you really can just think of Postgres as one append-only log. And underneath, there's a, a actual log file called the write-ahead log, um, which is useful for things like disaster recovery and otherwise. So stepping back and pausing for a minute, um, you know, at, there's a lot of talks at this conference about open source. And there's going to be people that are going to debate licenses and debate, you know, how do we leverage open source? What's the you know, way to be a good steward? Um, how do you give back in the right way? To me, open source is a really, really loaded term, and I don't want to get into that. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of talks that cover that. But what is interesting, I think, is, is Postgres is unique as open source. Um, open source just means, hey, the code is open. You can take, read it, change it possibly, do something with it. Um, Postgres goes one step further, where it's actually community-led, community-run, um, community-owned. Um, if you look at something like a MySQL or Mongo open source, yet they're still owned and run by a single company. Whereas Postgres, it's a little bit different. Um, it's probably more similar to Linux with no benevolent, benevolent dictator. There's a core team, which is really just a small steering com committee. Uh, they handle things like licensing, non-code items, but um, it's that team is split up. There's no more than uh, two people from one company on, on the core team. You've got a whole bunch of committers. Uh, it takes a while to get your commitment to Postgres. It's not something you're doing in a week or two. It's a multi-year project. Um, that's just the ability to commit a, 
a patch. You've got major contributors that will write major features, but not actually have that commit bit. Um, committers tend to show up and take a while to get there, but then stick around for quite a while. And you've got minor contributors as well. You know, someone that's written something small, um, not kind of a headline feature, but, but added a nice feature to Postgres. Um, features get contributed based on what engineers want to work on. It's not driven by large companies. Um, now those committers are distributed across a whole bunch of companies. It's not just a, you know, Amazon and Google and Microsoft where, hey, the project came out of there. Um, the, it's quite a global team. Um, I would venture to say there's probably at least representation of 20 different companies there, but I'd have to check. Um, activity happens on the mailing list. Um, if you want to go and learn about Postgres, the PG SQL users uh, mailing list is a, a good one to go and read. There's people looking at debugging and that sort of thing. Um, if you want to fall asleep at night, the PG SQL hackers list is where I would go. Um, that's where the internal development happens. People show up with patches, deep debugging, that sort of thing. Um, if you want to learn about the internals of Postgres, it's a fascinating read. Uh, so really quickly, um, I, uh, I'm a fan of PSQL. It's the command line that ships with Postgres. Uh, if you work on a command line much, you probably have like a bash RC set up. Um, with PSQL, you can do the exact same thing and have like custom commands set up automatically that are really useful and helpful and will give you more power. Um, one really handy one is timing. This will automatically report the timing that it takes when you, every time you run a query. Um, backslash X auto. Uh, it's really nice for auto formatting the, the text on your screen. Backslash watch will just rerun your query and output that result every two seconds. So if you're running a query and want to wait and see it for the results to change, really, really handy. If you do backslash E, it'll open up the query that you're working on in your default editor. You could actually set this up as like a sublime text or VS code or something like that. It'll auto open that query. When you close and save that, it'll pipe that back to PSQL and automatically run that. So if you don't want to work in the CLI for editing your SQL, just so, set up your editor environment variable and use backslash E, really, really handy. So when I think about Postgres, um, I like to steal this term from uh, the Django community. Uh, I like Django, it's a nice web framework um, and they have this logo, I think they're starting to do away with it more, but they had this logo for years called, you know, batteries included. And the idea was everything you needed to get up and running with a web app. Uh, you didn't have to go grab anything else off the shelf. You needed authentication, you needed session management, CSRF projection, you needed an admin screen, all these things that you would need in building a web app that were really common. Well, they were there in the framework itself. You didn't have to go grab them for something else. And when I look at Postgres, it's really, really rich. And we're gonna get, try to get through a lot of this really quickly. There's a rich set of data types, which is really useful in and of its own, own regard. Rich indexing, um, there's more batteries there. There's extensions, foreign data wrappers. So we're going to get through hopefully most of this. It's going to be kind of a whirlwind tour, um, but it'll give you, you know, hopefully something you didn't know about, even if you know a good bit about Postgres already, and then you can go and kind of dig in deeper from there. So first on data types. Postgres has a really open liberal approach to adding data types. It's not, we've got our five data types and that's all we ever need. Um, they'll come in and add things like timestamps, um, you know, shapes for geospatial stuff. Range types is really useful. Um, basically, you'll see a new data type appear every couple of years in Postgres. And for the early years, there are a lot showing up really quickly. Uh, a few to highlight. Um, I'm gonna start on a bad one, money. Just don't use it. Uh, it's not great about precision. Um, it only really knows a single currency. So you, you know, um, if you are working in a global sense, not quite so useful there. Um, the precision's not as good. Most modern frameworks don't use the money data type. Um, it's one that admittedly should be done away with, but uh, it's there, people use it, I'd stay away from it. Um, serial, here's one that if you're using uh, unique identifiers for primary keys, I would actually say skip it. Um, a lot of people really like it. It's an auto incrementing primary key. Um, it has some limits. Um, if you use a big int, you're in a better shape here. Uh, personally, I really like UUIDs, which Postgres has a 
built in type for. Um, the purists of Postgres will disagree with me here saying, oh no, it's a little bit larger to index. If you're not at Instagram, TikTok, Facebook scale, you're absolutely fine. Um, I've run many large scale database into literally the hundreds of terabytes and UUIDs work great for primary keys. As you start to expose these in places for like URLs and otherwise, then you're not leaking the IDs. It's a really kind of nice way. It's not saying you don't secure things there, but it's, hey, you're not leaking a little bit of information, which is nice. There's a whole set of shapes. There's boxes, there's polygons, there's points. Um, you can use these basic ones for really, really short. Hey, what's the distance from this point to this point? Um, there's a handy function earth distance for that. You also have post GIS, which we'll talk about in a, a little bit, not in crazy detail, because it's we can go pretty deep on it, um, but we'll definitely hit on it a little bit. So XML, this is a really fun one, and I'm entirely just kidding here, except for um, when I talk with some of the, the database kind of gray beard people that have been working on the system for truly 20, 30 years, um, I had conversations with them about 10 years ago now about JSON. Um, and, and JSON came to Postgres in 9.2. Um, in 9.2, we kind of cheated. Uh, don't tell anyone, but we did. We validated JSON as it came in and shoved it into a text field. There was no extra kind of compression or what normally comes with JSON. It was literally, we validated that it was valid JSON as it came in and shoved it in a text field, white space and all. A couple years later, we got JSONB. Uh, my colleague says the B stands for better, uh, but it's a binary representation on disk. This is much more of what you get with Mongo, where it's compressed, you can index into it. You usually want JSONB when you're using JSON in an application. But 10 years ago, I was having a conversation with one of the people that contributes to Postgres, and he said, oh yeah, JSON, it's gonna come and go. I've seen this before. There was a time 20 years ago when document databases were gonna take over the world. And we had these XML single built databases. And uh, they're like, yeah, we added XML. Now we've got to maintain it and it's annoying and no one uses it. Um, I think they, I'm glad they saw the light on JSON. JSON much, much more broadly useful, obviously. Um, hopefully some people out there are using it. I use it in almost every application. It's really useful when you just wanna have some extra data or some flexibility there. The fact that you can index all the keys and uh, values within it, really, really, really handy there. But uh, personally, I do claim that with XML coming uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago or so in Postgres, it was technically a document database way back then. So it was the first document database that's still around today is, is my claim. So a uh, few other ones. Uh, timestamps uh, with time zone, really useful. We'll do a uh, basic uh, time zone conversion for you. Really handy when you know, you know, connecting in one place and want to know what time it is versus another place. Um, it'll save the state based on, hey, your web server, where it connects, where's it running at, that sort of thing. Really, really useful for basic time zone math. Um, intervals, really handy when you're saying, hey, I want to see all the users that have signed up in the last hour. You can grab now, which is a literal, and it'll basically you know, grab the time for now and subtract one hour as an interval from it. You can do minutes, days, et cetera. Really, really handy in you know, quick reporting for, hey, users that have signed up in the last week. Arrays, really useful. I'm a big fan of if I'm using a data type in my application, can I use it in my database? Uh, arrays are useful for things like tags. Um, if you want a, you know, um, tags, categories, that sort of thing, really handy without having to join against a whole other table. Uh, range types are a special purpose type of array. They have a start and they have an end value. They can be open-ended, so it can be a start with no end. But if you're doing anything with calendaring, this is really, really useful. You can set um, constraints then so that, hey, we're only allowed to have 30 people attend the talk at a time because we've only got 30 seats when we eventually can go back to a room with chairs. And so people can register for this. And then as soon as that person, you know, registers above that 30 mark, great. But they also can't register for overlapping uh, talks at the same time. You know they can't occupy two seats, so they've got to pick, hey, if this overlaps another range that you're 
signed up for, you know, if you're a college scheduling application, this is really, really useful because otherwise you can get race conditions here, which get pretty hard to clean up. So uh, if you're using an a data type in your application, I highly recommend take a look and see if there's a Postgres data type. It's really, really useful. If you think, oh, I wonder if it's there, it probably is. Um, it'll be performant. It'll give you extra functionality when leveraging and querying it. Really, really, really handy. All right, on to indexing. Uh, Postgres has a lot of indexes. Most databases, you'll just see one type. Postgres seems to show up with a new index type about every year to every year and a half, kind of. Um, uh, some years we'll skip one and it's the second year, but um, it seems to be almost a new index type every year. Um, if you go through the docs and you read this, uh, your reaction is, is probably a little like this. Um, I've read the docs. It took me a little while to get the, the dumbed down version that I could understand of you know when to use all these indexes, and I'm still not perfect on it. Um, usually, uh, if you're doing standard text, standard numbers, just really basic column types, um, you just want something to go faster, this is probably what you want, a B3 index. This is what you learn about in CS school. You don't know any better if you just say create index, this is what you get. And it's usually okay. It's when you start to leverage more of the other data types or you have really large data and complex problems that you want to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, a gen index, a generalized inverted index, really useful for arrays, JSON. Um, so anytime I create a JSONB uh, data type, I usually go throw a gen index on it. That's going to index all my keys and values. So when I query, it's going to be able to use that index instead of scanning all of that text and parsing it out. Um, really useful basically anytime you have multiple values in a single column, right? So in arrays, you could have multiple categories. In JSON, you've got you know, multiple keys and values and it can get pretty well nested there. Just uh, really useful for full text search and shapes. If you think about it, when you've got values that span across a boundary, so if you've got like polygons that uh, have different shapes and you can have points within the polygon, points with out of the polygon, right? And you wanna know where does a point fall? Does it fall in that polygon or out? Just uh, is really useful for that kind of thing. Um, full text search where you've got paragraphs and paragraphs and you want to index all of it, but you only want to search for certain parts of uh, speech. Uh, so really, really useful there. If you're looking at, uh, you know, the other ones, these are much, much more useful on uh, really large data sets primarily. Um, I've asked the Postgres core kind of contributors and committers a number of times. Uh, to get a simplified answer. The use case I've heard for SPGIS is basically phone numbers. Um, essentially where you've got data that kind of naturally cluster, clusters together. If you think about phone numbers, you've got a uh, area code, then usually three digits to kind of cluster together. Then you've got the unique four digits there as well. Um, so there's kind of natural clustering blocks. Um, that's similar for block range index. Uh, block range is truly billions and billions of record most commonly in the table uh, that naturally cluster together. These are much more specialized. I'd say like you're digging pretty deep if you're starting to use these or you're working with some Postgres consultant that's really kind of got some, some large tables and some gnarly performance optimization uh, to do there. Um, so when I say batteries included, um, there's a, uh, a blog post that was written a couple of years ago that the title is uh, Postgres full text search is good enough. And it, it summarized it really well. They basically said, hey, I needed to add full text search to my application. I, I was gonna go to use Elastic and I started digging in and here it is with Postgres. And it absolutely works. Um, it's built for a lot of languages. Um, you've got you know, common ones, English, French, German, Russian. It doesn't do a lot of the, the Asian language, Japanese, Chinese, there are extensions specifically to do that just because of the kind of lexical nature of those, them is very different. But you've got all the common things in full text search, simming, you can you know, rank and you know, boost, fuzzy search if you wanna look for misspellings, right? Of, hey, it was, it's kind of close to this. How does it rank and compare? Um, you build your text document with TS vector so you can combine different columns for your document. Uh, and then you search with TS query. 
really, really useful. Um, the docs are good on this. If you need full text search in your application and you're not building a you know custom built search engine, I'd say it's really useful to just try to dig in here. A lot of the times when you need to add something to Postgres, you can go get a whole new system or you can say, well, let's see what Postgres can do. And usually it's good enough, which means now you don't have to worry about ETL and keeping things in sync. Uh, you don't have one more system to maintain. Really, really useful in that regards. Another huge one is PostGIS. And I have one really small slide here that doesn't do it justice at all. Um, and the reality is once I go down this path of PostGIS, I'll be talking for the next 45 minutes just about PostGIS. It is well regarded by pretty much everyone as the richest open source geospatial database. It has more features than Oracle Geospatial. Probably the only thing that really beats it out is, is Esri, a commercial licensed geospatial database. Um, when you install the extension, you get new data types, you get new functions, you've got things like PG Routing for, for finding paths right along streets and mapping that sort of thing. You can do rastering within the database actually. Really, really rich uh, extension, probably the most feature rich extension that ex exists within Postgres. And um, there's an entire kind of community that develops alongside the Postgres core community. So they've got their own release schedule, own cadence, own set of contributors and committers, um, a pretty large code space in and of itself that works with the Postgres committers and community, but also has its own separate parallel track. So really, really fascinating. Um, I mentioned JSONB already. Uh, a little while back, we had HStore. If you see any older applications, you may have it laying around. It's a key value store data type that predated JSON. Then we got JSON. Um, JSON is actually really useful if you're just recording a lot of JSON text really fast. Things like if you want to record logs or API inputs, they'll preserve white space. That can be useful if you're looking to go replay logs. But most of the time, you want JSONB. So really, you've got like a document database directly inside Postgres. Really, really powerful there. So continuing on on this journey, uh, Postgres to me is really interesting because of batteries included. In the last five years ago or so, it's become even more interesting because of extensions. So PostGIS is one of those. Extensions are really, really low level hooks that allow you to change how Postgres is working and behaving. So you can change really deep into the internals. You can change, add new data types, new functions. You can change the query planner. So you can make it go to like dev null if you wanted to. Um, really fascinating that you can go and make it be in like an entirely other database. So people have gone and kind of changed Postgres to be time series related, to be geospatial, all of these things with this extension framework. And I kind of hate the name extensions because you know everything has extensions or plugins or something like that. Um, this is truly unique. I haven't seen something that goes this deep in other databases. So a really brief tour, um, one everyone should know about uh, is PG stat statements. It comes with Postgres. You may need to turn it on. That's just create extension PG stat statements. Really useful for identifying performance issues later and, and recording a whole lot of data. What it's going to do is record every query that runs against your database and a whole bunch of data about it. So uh, you can see if this, you know, I'm looking for this query where, you know, select from something from users equals email. Uh, it's going to record how many times this ran, uh, the total time it took, how many rows it typically returns, all this data about the, the heap underneath and, you know, how many blocks it dirty, how many it wrote, all that sort of thing. What's nice about this is you can do some things like aggregate queries like this, where I can say, give me the total time uh, that this query ran, give me the time it took on average, and let's order by the total time consumed against my application. So I can get something really, really useful with this one query to say, oh, what are my most expensive queries? Uh, here I've got one that runs on average in 10 milliseconds. I've got one on an average that runs in 80. Uh, from what I know, generally I can get a query down to one millisecond or so. Um, so in total, this one consumed 295 seconds. This one's 200 seconds. I could actually go and you know, add an index here and probably get an order of magnitude back and get a lot more performance out of my database. Really, really useful. If you haven't already turned it on, turn it on. When you do want to do performance investigation, a lot of tools for Postgres out there are going to leverage it. Um, 
you can Google and find a bunch of basic queries to give you really good insights right out of the box. Um, another one, uh, just as an example, PG Partman. Um, I mentioned batteries included. You've got PostGIS, which is an extension. You've got external ones. PG Partman is one of those, really for time series data. Um, time partitioning is becoming more and more native in Postgres, but until it's perfect, uh, PG Partman helps with a lot of that. I'm going to kind of fly through this code example because we're about midway and a little over mid time. Uh, here, if I've got a, a table I want to set up, I've got an events table for IoT data. I've got some payload that's coming in here with JSON B and some actor that's coming in with JSON B. I want to partition by the created at, right? Typical time based partitioning. My events are coming in. I want to create a uh, partition for maybe the, you know, each day, each five minutes, each hour. Uh, I'm going to create this table like normal and then just say partition by range, which is needed to Postgres. Then I'm going to come in here to PG Partman and tell it how to automatically set up all those partitions for me. So what it's going to do is monitor when data is coming in and create those partitions ahead of time. So it's going to create four in front of the data that I have. So they're already created, ready to ingest data. Um, I can prune off uh, data if I want so I can uh, um, get rid of old data after it's been there a month, or I can keep it for all of time. Um, so here I'm setting it to infinite data. Really, really useful. Under the covers, I'm going to have an events table, and I'm going to have all these other tables. It's up to you how you want to reference this. You can just query events. Postgres is automatically going to do the right thing of joining. You can see we've got here five-minute partitions. You can go and look at the raw data. It's automatically going to do this and take care of this for you. Um, one really nice thing that I do like personally about PG Partman, all of its config is directly in the database. Like this is just a table. You can query it, you can update it. And now you suddenly have intervals of, you know, 10 minutes instead of five. Uh, you can change all sorts of things about it. Um, there's probably about 20, 25 configs. The docs are really good about saying, you know, which ones you need to set up right away. Things like pre-making your partitions so that when new data comes in, you don't have to do that on the fly. Really, really useful. So extensions, I could go on for a really long time. I think they're a fascinating area within Postgres. They don't get enough attention. Um, there's some that come right out of the box. Uh, there's some that you need to go install yourself. Um, on Crunchy Bridge or Databases of Service, these are one of the big areas we're really invested in. Um, adding new extensions, allowing you to do new things so that the Postgres core can can be this really stable piece of reliable software. It focuses on not losing data, making performance faster. Uh, at the same time, people want more and more features, but they maybe don't belong in core or they do, it's in time. So just a few to quickly highlight, PG stat statements, turn it on if it's not already on your database. If you want time partitioning, you've got PG Partman, really useful. If you're doing geospatial stuff, you've probably heard about PostGIS. ZomboDB is a fascinating one that allows you to index your data in Elasticsearch from within Postgres. So it will keep all your data in sync from Postgres over to Elasticsearch. Then inside standard SQL, you can use uh, standard Postgres to query the data and it'll leverage a uh, Elasticsearch index. Really, really interesting. If you wanna go and curl and scrape a bunch of websites, HTTP to just hit an API endpoint and get data back in JSON, really, really interesting. Simple, but really potentially useful. Uh, C store is a columnar store for compression in Postgres. And then Madlib. Madlib is another really old one like PostGIS. It's been around over 10 years, came out of UC Berkeley. It's an entire like AI data science ML library. It has unsupervised learning, supervised learning, almost everything you could want to do optimized in C directly in your database. You don't have to go write this from scratch yourself. Really, really fascinating one that I'm surprised more people haven't been talking about that's been around for, for 10 years and is quite mature actually. So um, if you wanna dig into the data science world and, and don't wanna to have to write the algorithm yourself, it's probably there in Madlib already for you. There's also another really special category, uh, foreign data wrappers that allow you to connect from Postgres to something else really natively. Um, you've got ones to connect to Redis, to Mongo, you've got CStore, which is the columnar one. Really pretty simple to set up. You, you create a foreign server. Um, this is a specific kind of foreign data wrapper API. 
you say, hey, what's my connection string to it? Um, you create the foreign table, which is just a mapping from that. Um, so you can map specific Mongo uh, documents here. You know, Redis, it's just key value. So we're just mapping it to some foreign table. And then you, you know, how do you access this? What's the, you know, the user and password? And then as I describe my table, I've got my standard Postgres tables and I've got this foreign table here. I can just query that, um, select star from my Redis table and I get data back directly from Redis. Now it's worth mentioning that the Redis one is not optimized. Every time you query this, it's gonna pull back everything from Redis. Um, there are some that are much more optimized. So like there's a Postgres foreign data wrapper for connecting two different Postgres databases. This is optimized and it'll do things like query pushdown really, really useful and handy uh, for like occasional ETL, occasionally migrating data, um, really, really handy. There's one for Oracle, there's one for Mongo. Really useful when you're querying uh, disparate systems. And then I can join this. So for Redis, everything comes back as text. I've got to do some casting here um, to, to join. But you can see I can query my users table, join this against Redis where I'm keeping track of visitors. Uh, and I'm looking for anyone that's come to my website, you know, more than 40 times. Maybe I want to run an ad for them. Maybe I want to run an email campaign, but really handy to not have to go, you know, do some ETL process on this. Um, a little bit of uh, detour. Um, to me, SQL is a really powerful language. Um, I, I value SQL. Uh, a lot of times when I'm in a room giving a talk, I ask people to, to raise their hands. I don't know how quickly or easy that is to do here. Um, feel free to kind of virtually raise your hand if you, you know, enjoy writing SQL. Usually uh, I'll see like five or 10 hands out of 100 to 200 people. Um, then I typically shift the question of who likes reading SQL, especially SQL that someone else has written. Um, and it usually drops to one and uh, that person and I go have a, a nice long kind of uh, commiserating you know, drink in the evening uh, on the awful SQL we've seen other people write. Um, SQL is a really powerful language. You can definitely write better SQL and I encourage people to do that. Um, a few kind of basics, uh, indent it, use casing, use comments. You can comment inline SQL just like you do your code. Probably most of the people listening have some level of comments in their code. Um, I'm really curious for how many actually have comments in your SQL. You can do this, there's no reason you shouldn't. There's another thing that's really useful for more readable SQL, which is common table expressions. These are like logical blocks and views that you can build up queries over logical steps and reference the previous ones. So it's not always gonna be super optimized for performance, but when you're writing a report that it's more about readability when someone comes back in six months and a year to try to figure out what you were doing, really, really, really useful. Um, a quick kind of look at this. This is a lot of uh, SQL on the screen, but I'm quickly gonna, gonna flip through this to give some idea. You can see here that I've got an initial comment right here. This is in line, not gonna execute, but you can see that I'm doing a really basic query here from uh, three different tables. I'm joining my users and my projects to get back a list of all the task lists uh, for a specific project by, uh, by the individual user. I'm gonna come later and actually group that. So I'm gonna do a separate one and calculate the total of each task for the project. So nice inline comment here. You can actually see my indentation pretty easy to follow that my key SQL pieces are here together and like the columns coming out are all the same line. Easy to come through if I wanted to delete, delete or find the next one, not all on the same line. Uh, I'm gonna come back in here again. And again, I'm flying through this. The example will be online. So you can feel free to come and, and look through this. Um, here, I'm gonna uh, get the projects per each user again. I don't have to read through the SQL and say, oh, what, what task am I you know, referencing? Um, easily grouped and, and ability to parse this. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is filter for all of my users that have over 50% of the task assigned. Basically, which users are carrying the heavy load in my, they, uh, my project kind of tracking application. So um, who's doing most of the work where we should figure it out and distribute it? What's my you know, bottleneck? How can I offload work to someone? And in the end, I'm gonna reference these two different tables that I created. 
basically these views that only exist for this CTE. Uh, so user task and overloaded users. Uh, and I want to find and get all those tasks and say, hey, can we take some of these tasks and give them out to someone else? So again, a pretty long query. Um, I flew through that, not sure if people were able to easily follow, but you know, easily in a couple of minutes, you could go and grok what's going on here. And this is, you know, 40 lines or so of SQL. Normally, if I were to do this in the most optimized compressed way, um, your eyes are just going to kind of go blurry and you're not going to be able to parse what's going on. It's going to take you a lot more time. So TTE is a really useful tool for writing better SQL. Uh, there's another one that is my latest fascination. Um, so if you're writing procedural SQL um, functions and that sort of thing, um, a lot of this is PLPG SQL. There's other options. There's things like PLV8, PL Python, PLR. Uh, PL Python is my latest in infatuation of like, I wonder if I can do this in my database. Um, at first, I'm like, this is probably not a good idea. Um, then I started thinking about it. And the more I think maybe it's actually not so crazy. Um, I started a couple of months ago with a tweet saying, hey, I've got PL Python. I just wonder if I could go and create a recommendation engine inside my database. And so I I started, there's a lot of code here. I'm going to try to jump to a couple of smaller blocks of it. Um, first thing I was doing is like, well, can I install pandas directly inside my database? Can I go and run pandas directly from inside Postgres and have that do a basic kind of recommendation engine? Um, and so for there, I'm going to pass in all of the order, past orders. I'm going to pass in, you know, the products that are in a customer's cart. And then I'm basically going to do the rest of the work in pandas. Uh, again, a little tight on time here. So not gonna, I think, drill too deep to the code here. Um, if you're a Python person, come back through, read this, probably tell me how I did it horribly inefficient from a pandas perspective. But really, really to me a, hey, can I create a recommendation engine directly inside Postgres? And about two hours later in 20 lines of PL Python and pandas, I had a recommendation engine that I could live feed in my, my table, um, feed in what's in a customer's cart, and then get back a, hey, you should recommend these products to this person. Um, this is also going to be a lot more readable than writing PLPG SQL. So uh, oh, I think a really interesting, you've got a lot of options uh, with Postgres. You've got things like PLV8, which is JavaScript directly inside your Postgres database. So if you've got a lot of JSONB and want to do interesting stuff there, you can operate on it in JavaScript. Uh, PL Python, PLR, um, really handy R for a lot of data science that you could do directly in the database. It simplifies a lot of the stack. If you don't want to have to do ETL into a Kafka out to Spark to have your data lake to feed it back into to Redis or Postgres to then target the user, you could do a lot of this directly inside Postgres. So what's the future hold for Postgres? Um, the most recent, I think, big advancement is, is pluggable storage. Uh, in development, now there are a couple different backends. So Postgres got pluggable storage that you can come in and change the storage type storage engine. There's two in active development, one Zheap, uh, which are some improvements to, to Postgres uh, for auto vacuum. Um, there's another one, ZStore, which is native columnar storage. I think this is going to be really interesting for the coming years. Pluggable at storage itself is directly in core. Um, in development are these other engines that you can come in and uh, do other things. Uh, for the, the core itself, I expect the Postgres core to move at a steady, stable pace. Postgres is really feature rich. Hopefully that came across throughout the last, you know, 40 minute whirlwind tour. Um, Hopefully, there is something everyone didn't realize Postgres could do that there is this option for now, whether it's full text search or geospatial or um, crazy extensions or just the data types. Um, even the, the basic of the performance analysis you can do directly in Postgres. Postgres is going to get more pluggable. We're going to expose more and more of those hooks, and we're just going to keep improving performance. Performance always matter when it comes to your database. We're just going to keep advancing more and more and more along that lines. You know, outside Kurt, sorry, to yep. sorry to interrupt, but we have five minutes left. Perfect. Outside of core, um, 
I think we're going to see a lot of extensions, right? Um, more that you can tack on, that you can extend, you can enhance, you could do interesting things. And over time, the really useful ones that are broadly applicable will come into core. Others will stay outside and can be easily installed. So as I kind of wrap up on that initial question, why Postgres, right? Um, where I, you know, it's really feature rich, but I do think uh, this idea of open source and community managed, community led, community developed, community owned, no one else can ever actually own Postgres. It's not like a MySQL where you can have someone come in and own the copyright. Um, it's truly unique in that fashion um, from most other projects that I know of. Most other projects come out of a single company and are still run and maintained by a single company. You've got some exceptions to that in the JavaScript world where they eventually evolve and a ton of contributors. But for something like Postgres, I want a high bar of a contributor. I don't want any random person showing up and saying, oh yeah, let's change this index type because it's my data and you could lose it. But at the same time, I you know, want more contributions. So you've got people contributing to docs and community in a lot of ways, but that uh, community owned aspect of it is really fascinating. And then, you know, there's a whole lot inside the box. Um, that's, I think, where I, where I end is, you know, you know, why Postgres? Because it can do pretty much everything. Should it do everything? Some things maybe are crazy. I've seen, you know, crazy extensions and foreign data wrappers. But I think that's part of the fun of, you know, what we get to do as developers of, like, let's imagine the crazy and see if it works. And sometimes it's not as crazy as we think. So uh, just a couple minutes for questions here in the end. So feel free to drop them in. Um, it looks like there's one already around, you know, is there a PL Python editor that does correct syntax highlighting? That is a wonderful question. Um, I would say write your PL Python probably directly in your standard Python editor. Um, a lot of it, you've got your, you know, function call kind of wrapper on the outside, but then the rest of it is mostly just Python. And I would expect that to parse in a standard editor, like, a um, like VS code or something like that. But let me also go back and check. I don't know that there's a place that I would say, this is where I always edit my PL Python. Um, so uh, I would try VS Code and see how that works um, and start there. There is one comment, Roll Tide. I appreciate that. I'm actually out in California. I'm originally from Alabama and I wear the hat all the time. If you see me maybe next year in person at All Things Open, feel free to come say hi. Uh, sorry to miss people in person this year, but uh, yeah, I don't get a lot of roll tides out on the, the West Coast, so I do appreciate that. <laughs>